I had a different title for this one, and I actually, it's, it's a rare thing. Once I submit my title, it's sort of a done deal because then Annie is, you know, dealing with graphics for the cover. And, uh, but the night, praise God that Annie was a little slower and delayed. She could have been slow and delayed because she didn't know what to do with my title. That's a, a good possibility. But uh, I ended up uh, sort of when I was laying in bed that night. Remember, Leslie's not around. She was in New Mexico. So I didn't have, a, you know, a sounding board to say, hey, Leslie, what do you think of this title? And so it was just me. And when you just leave Eric by himself with the title, bad things can happen. Uh, and so I had, you know, the title is Choosing the Lowly Chair. I had Selecting the Stinky Seat. Uh, and so then as I was laying there in bed, I was pondering how Annie creates a graphic for the stinky seat. And all I could think of was a toilet, and I thought, okay, this isn't good. Because uh, that's not the direction that this is. This is not going in that way. Stinky to me is, me is a funny word for really bad. You know, okay, that, that's the stinky option. It doesn't mean it has to smell, right? But that, it was a bad title, okay? So it has been overruled, and now we have a far better title. And I'm sure Annie, who didn't make any comment on it, by the way, is very pleased uh, with the option. Uh, choosing the lowly chair. Now, for those of you that know scripture, you know the stories of Jesus, you understand sort of what that could be talking about. The seat, the chair is symbolic of a position of choice. It is sitting there in front of us. There's multiple chairs open, but we symbolically in life are choosing a chair. And if I could break down that chair, because you know, when we think of a banquet table, we think of many chairs. But really, there seems to be a couple options that seem to be paramount for us to choose from, and that is a seat of honor or a seat that would cause us to look impressive to the world, that would cause people to think highly of us, and then there's a low seat. And that low seat is not attractive to us in the least. There is nothing in us that, is, that gravitates towards it naturally. And yet Jesus is going to come in and he says, look, I'm making you new. I want to teach you how to live this life in this body in a manner that truly will change the world. I want you to reveal the unseen realm in and through how you choose your seat. And he says, that's the seat I want you to take. And we look over there and we're like, you've got to be kidding. It's not attractive to us. And yet, when we put on the glasses of heaven, we recognize something about that seat. It is actually, in a strange way, the seat that when we sit in it, it changes our life and it changes the world around us. And when you can look at it that way, it doesn't have a negative hue to it. It turns and flips on its head the very attitude or perspective that we normally carry and causes us to be attracted to something. It's like, huh, that's the seat I want. Before every revival, what we desire as the church right now, in fact, we just prayed for it before we entered into this message, is we want revival. We want revival here in this room, but that starts with an individual. It doesn't, corporate revival is actually individual revival on a greater scale. It's, it's like a firebrand catching on to someone else and they light too and the whole room suddenly is lit. It really doesn't matter who caught first. It's just that we all caught but then this church then goes into the culture and starts lighting it on fire. A revival is what we desire. We desire, to, we desire to see culture shift in its direction. It's headed over a cliff into eternal hellfire right now. It's not looking pretty. What do we desire? We desire that to shift, that to change. So if we're going to start with this idea of revival and say that God is desirous of it, he desires revival, well, what is before that? What is the cause effect relationship what causes revival so before every revival prayer that which causes revival is something known as prayer so you're not going to find a revival in an individual life or in a corporate life if there's not prayer before it that is seems to be that which proceeds revival is revival praying and so many books have been written on that. If you ever read Leonard Ravenhill, he's one of my favorites on that topic, Revival Praying. I think he even has a book called Revival Praying. And so that's just a starter package. But now listen to this question. Before every prayer for revival, so if you're going to have revival praying and you're going to have prayer for revival, there's something that precedes that. Well, what precedes the body of Christ beginning to come together and pray for revival? Humility. Humility 
is actually the baseline. It is the beginning point for the movement of the Holy Spirit in and through the church. In the individual life, if you want to be sparked and to grow strong as a Christian, there is something that is necessary as a beginning point, and that's humility. And it's funny, we can enter this place of humility. It's like when we enter into it, doors open in our spiritual lives, and they all unlock. When we are in that place of humility, but we can easily gravitate out of that place, and you'll notice that doors go kunk, 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 and start closing. And so we had open hallways, we had open rooms, and the Spirit of God could move in our life and could rearrange furniture, he could sanctify, he could do all this work. But we are prone. You ever notice that? It's like that one uh, hymn, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the Lord I love. It's like, what? I love you, Lord. Why am I prone? But the reason we must die daily, the reason we must pick up our cross daily is because we are prone. God knows that we're prone. He knows that we are angled or aimed away from him in a natural bent. It's like there's something wrong with us, which is why we must deliberately choose to remember him. We must exercise certain things in our life to maintain an abiding relationship. And when we abide, he unlocks the doors. And so our desire is to remain in that position. But what is that position? Humility. Humility is, in a sense, that place that we must remain. And most of us know when we are there and when we're not there. Of course, have you ever heard someone brag about their humility? It doesn't usually sound very good, does it? I've, I've been, I feel like I'm really doing well in humility this, in this season. That doesn't sound very good. And yet, at the same time, we're, we're aware when we're allowing the Spirit of God to take us to the low seat. And we're aware when we're clamoring for the higher seats. And when someone takes a seat, we're like, hey, that's mine. And we recognize it because the Spirit of God is very gracious. He's very good at saying, <clears throat> that's all he has to do is clear his throat sometimes. We know exactly what he's clearing his throat about. So before every prayer for revival is humility. So Proverbs, uh, you see this twice in Proverbs, this exact same statement. So 1533 and then 1812. Before honor is humility. Now this word for honor is this idea, it's hard for us because when we think of honor, and it's not an incorrect statement, we think of like being noted. You know, it's like, oh, and everyone in the, the world is like, that person has lived well. Well, that is honor. But in this concept, it's the idea of something strong, to become strong, to become impactful, to become, to reveal the glory of God, what do you need? Well, before that is something, it's humility. So humility is prior to that strength emerging in your life, to the impact of changing the world around you, this thing called honor, as it's translated here. So here's a way of looking at it. This is sort of an expanded idea of this. Before, honor is humility, but if we took that and I replaced it with this parenthetical, before the spiritual growth, the spiritual breakthrough, the spiritual power is humility. Those three things, spiritual growth, spiritual breakthrough, spiritual power, it's hard for me to imagine that in this room that isn't the craving of our soul as Christians. That's what we want. So what is before that? What is the cause? It's humility. When you are willing to humble yourself and agree with the Spirit of God where he is wanting to take us, and I'm going to say it's to a seat. It's to a lowly seat. And he's like, and, but our natural man is like, I don't want to go there. I've sat in that seat before, and now I've mo- worked my way up the table. I-, I would like to sort of stay at my spot in the table. He's like, could we freshly go back to that seat? It'll unlock doors for you. See, there's something I want to do in your life, but you think that you know, graduating up the table is your great goal. I want you actually to take the lowest seat. Jesus died in the lowest seat. He took the lowest seat. He wasn't just clamoring. The reason he got to the highest place is because he took the lowest seat. 2 Chronicles 7.14. This, of course, is something we're very familiar with. Over the last two years, I think it's one of the most quoted scriptures in the Bible because we're all like, the world's fallen to pieces. And so we go back to 2 Chronicles 7.14, but look at what is baked into it. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So what is the beginning? It's humility. What follows that? 
prayer. What follows that? Revival. In other words, you see that flow even unveiled in this pattern as we see in 2 Chronicles. The language of heaven. There's, there's been debates over, I don't know why people, some of the things that people debate over, I don't know if you've noticed it, but you just sort of shake your head and go, are we actually talking about this? Is this a real conversation? So one of the debates is what language we'll speak in heaven. Because there's people that really care about this because they believe it should, it's going to be Hebrew. Because God's initial language, his native tongue is Hebrew. And so there is like, hey, we're going to be returning to that. And so we should learn Hebrew, right? And then there's others that are like, it's Koine Greek. It's obvious to me, his higher revelation, the second covenant was revealed in Koine Greek. I mean, these are good arguments, you have to admit. Why we're even talking about it, I'm not sure. And then there's other people that have the audacity to declare that it's going to be English. Because English is the bridge language in which Jesus returns and all of us sort of know it. Of course, who's usually coming up with that one? It's not someone who speaks Mandarin, right? Uh, and so, could you imagine it ends up being Mandarin? After all this time, we get up there and you're like, I can't do it If you speak Mandarin, you're like, that wasn't it, Eric. But some of you don't know that. Uh, you see, we don't speak that, right? Could you imagine getting up there like, oh, great. It's going to be like a year or two years for me to learn how to speak something in, in uh, heaven. Now, I think all of us are very confident, without even comparing notes, that when we get to heaven, no matter what language it is, we'll understand it. I don't know why we have that. It's just sort of baked in. It's like it just sort of comes with the package of a believer. It's like, yeah, when I get to heaven, I'll know what's going on. It, everything will be clear. It won't be muddy. It won't be confusing. God is not the author of confusion. If Babel was the place where everyone dispersed and all the languages were confused, well, heaven's going to be the place where they all unite. So I really don't care would be my response. However, I'm going to weigh in on it. And I'm going to say, actually, I have an opinion about this. You're like, Eric, you're getting into this argument? Yes, I'm jumping straight in with both feet. I believe I know the language of heaven, but it's going to be a shocking one. It's humility. You see, the language spoken in heaven is the low seat language. Could you imagine in heaven we're all vying for the low seat? You see, we'll understand the value of it more clearly. Here in this earth, it's foggy, and the devil's always baiting us and tempting us to a higher seat. But in heaven, it will finally be clear. It's actually the low seat that is the seat of honor. Truly, this is the seat of power. This is the seat of strength. And so we're all vying to wash each other's feet. Hey, I don't want Mike Hahn washing my feet. I want to wash his feet because that means he's going to be greater. I, I, I don't want him to be lower than me because the lower is truly the greatest. The greatest servant of all is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That is an astounding thought. He proved it. Even though we struggle to comprehend that, the greatest servant is actually our king, our Lord, our master, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Whoa! And we will see that more clearly. This is actually the language of heaven. Well, God designed us as believers to communicate his language. Whether or not you know Hebrew or Koine Greek or English or Mandarin doesn't make any difference. There's a language as a believer that we are called to speak. And of course, you could say the language of love, and you would be accurate. However, we speak humility in every word we, we speak, every action we speak. This is part of the translation. Yes, we do speak love, but we are speaking it in everything we do, every chair we pick, in every room we walk into, we are making a statement that is meant to be a heavenly statement. Luke 14, 7 through 11, he, speaking of Jesus, told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, when you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him, and he who invited you and him come and say to you, give place to this man, and then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. There's this idea of humbling yourself, sort of like there is an option on the table that we can choose. We can actually choose to humble ourselves. It's not just that we have to be made to be humbled. We have to be put in the lowest seat. 
It seems to be part of how we are built as Christians that we have this option and that we can choose to take that seat. We're not forced to take it, but if we don't take it, we'll be put in it anyways. But if we choose to take it, that's how God does his work in and through us. Now think about Jesus. He's the picture of this. He did not exalt himself. He was exalted above every other name, right? He is exalted right now to the highest place, seated at the right hand of the Father. However, there was something that happened before that. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. What does it say before that? He humbled himself. (laughs) That's the key. Therefore, God highly exalted him. This is the pattern. Jesus himself knows this, right? But he's explaining it to us. Then you will have glory with the presen- in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. That honor follows humility. And so that honor for us, translated into our realm, isn't just high position. Isn't just applause. In the kingdom of heaven, it is that we are in agreement and able to accomplish the spiritual ends that God designed us for. So truly, our lives are successful when we take the low seat. They are successful in our unique calling. It does not mean that it can't transcend into earthly success points, but that isn't our priority, is wealth. Our earthly priority isn't position and fame. Our earthly priority is the revelation of Jesus in and through us. You want to reveal Jesus? You want to fulfill your great purpose here? You want to show forth the glory of God in and through this humble body? Take the low seat. When you take that low seat, God will exalt you. He will utilize your life to reveal the unseen realm. Gravitating towards the seat of honor. It's like a magnetic pull. Have you ever noticed that? It's like... In, there's so many situations where you could even hear a message like this and you could be sitting around the table as a family and something happens which challenges, in a sense, what we could call your dignity, your reputation, where you are, I don't know, it's, it's impugning it somehow and you must defend it. In that moment, you have two seats in front of you. You have a seat of honor or defensiveness or pride, as we would understand it, or you have humility of taking the low position, accepting it, accepting it with grace, accepting it knowing that as you accept it, it's actually spiritually strengthening you. And yet, you could know that, that doesn't make it easy. This life is actually challenging. It is. I I don't know that you needed me to say that to know that. But when we come to Christ, a lot of us have this notion that in Christianity, it's like we're buoyed up. We're almost in a bubble and we're floating about. And the world's down here with all its trials and pains and challenges. And we're floating around in a bubble. And when we run up against something, boop, we sort of bounce off of it. That's not a fully accurate statement of how it works. Because it's more like the bubbles inside of us and in our soul. So we, our physical body, our physical mind could bounce up against something. And it really has a strain. But we have something inside of us that can hold us up and grant us something to make the right choices in and through that. Jesus, when he hung on the cross, wasn't spared the pain of the cross, which is a fascinating statement because we are the body of Christ and we are called to follow him. And so we need to recognize that we're not spared pain, we're not spared suffering, but we are given something to endure it. We are given something to enable us through it. And when we get to those points where we want to say, I don't want the challenge, I don't want the embarrassment, I don't want the suffering, I don't want the indecency, could you imagine being asked to strip naked and hang before your nation on a cross? There's some dignity issues here. He's the son of God. He shouldn't have to go through that. And we could all actually nod along and say, you're right. He didn't have to. He did it because he loved us. You could try and escape the challenges inerrant in following Jesus, but it's actually the privilege to take the low place. And when you take that low place and choose to follow Jesus and accept the, the, the terms that we have been given the same way Jesus did, where you see it right in front of you and, you, and it still says of you, and he or she humbled himself. 
and became obedient as a servant. That's a choice that many of us struggle with, but it is the core of a successful spiritual life. That is where the doors open. That is where the Spirit of God can move in our life and then through our life. However, when we protect ourselves in that moment and say, no, I will not allow that indecency. I will not allow that profaning of my name. I will not allow that humiliation to come towards me and have people think that thought of me. And we repel the opportunity and we choose pride and self-preservation over that low seat. In a sense, it blocks the flow of grace into our life and through our life. And so this is a challenging thing. I'm not going to argue that. It is. But when we finally agree that the low seat is actually, in a strange sense, the high seat in heaven, when we see it that way and we finally say this is actually for the glory of God, this is for the strengthening of my life, this is for the propulsion of my calling, then we have grace to make that choice and to say, I choose this seat though it be low in the world's eyes. Matthew 18, one through four. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them and said, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become his little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The ivory wall. Now, I've used this illustration many times, but it's not going to hurt anyone if they hear it again. Imagine an ivory wall is in front of us, and on the other side is the kingdom of heaven. And the ivory wall is this barrier. And so the first thought we have is, well, we get past the barrier. I mean, I, I just want the kingdom of heaven. Whatever it takes, I want it. And so I'm sure God really appreciates the fact that we're willing to do whatever it takes to get past this ivory wall and get in. However, what we don't understand is that there's really no way in. You can't climb over it. It goes like millions of miles into the sky. You can't go around it to the right because it spreads out millions of miles to the right. You can't go around it to the left because it goes millions of miles to the left. You can't dig underneath because it goes millions of miles into the earth. Wow. It's called the impassable barrier. And God himself makes it very clear there's really no way in. Oh, did I say no way? Actually, there is one way. And right where the dirt meets the ivory wall, there's this little crescent opening and the only way in is by humbling yourself. And that is the access into the kingdom of heaven. It's knowing that he has supplied everything, but it's there. But to get it, you have to humble yourself. You have to strip yourself of everything you have, all the world's goods, all the world's confidences, all the world's applause, and you have to become nothing. Even though you might look like nothing in this world by becoming a Christian, you're actually entering into the kingdom of heaven where you are a child beloved and adopted. By the way, the trade-off is great. However, on this side of the ivory wall, it doesn't look so nice. However, when you understand that you will be adorned in his clothing when you enter in, by humility, when you humble yourself, you are being clothed. You are being adorned. You are being strengthened. You are being empowered. This is the no-brainer of the century, isn't it? I mean, why wouldn't we give up our life here so that we could have his life in his presence. Why, why wouldn't we do that? And it's because of something known as pride. Pride is the great nemesis of everything I'm saying. There's something inside of us that wiggles even as I talk. Imagine that you didn't have this thing called pride. And you could just listen to a message like this and go, absolutely, low seat all day long. All day long, no issue. However, there is this flicker of something in us that is in combat mode with everything I'm saying. We want it, but we don't want it. Oh, I know, I really want the kingdom of heaven. Well, then humble yourself, Eric. Well, why does it have to come with that? Why can't it come on my terms? Because that's the whole issue, Eric. It needs to be on my terms. Humility is the access point. And your terms, are is, that's pride, by definition. I want it my way, on my terms, my timing, and Jesus says, could you let go of that? That is the one thing that is hindering you from finding the fullness of my presence. James 4.10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, 
and he will lift you up. It could say, humble yourself on the side of the Lord and he will exalt you. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's the same thing we've been saying in every situation, that before honor comes humility. Before being lifted up, before being established spiritually, before the spiritual breakthrough, before the spiritual power, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Then you will have that. You will have that buoy. You will have that strength. You will have that power if you humble yourself. So pride, the clogging of the pipeline. So I've given illustrations of pride in various ways. Uh, and I, it's, this isn't supposed to be a message on pride. However, pride sort of makes its way into the message, no matter how you cut it, because there is a great obstacle that we deal with. And so imagine that it was a pipeline and we have unlimited access to the kingdom riches. We have access to the inheritance. Now, when we hear parables in the New Testament about minas of silver or talents of gold, many people will translate that purely into economic illustration. It's like, oh, God's teaching us how to handle our finances and our natural giftings and abilities, because the word talent, well, that, I mean, that, to us as Americans, that means like a talent that I have, which I'm not going to say it can't translate into that. It could. However, the primary translation is grace. The thing you have been supplied by your king, he has given you a deposit. He has given you something, a trust. He has given you a pipeline access, and there's like a gate valve on it. However, to open that gate valve, we need to humble ourselves. That's, in a sense, the movement of soul that opens the gate valve and causes the grace of God to flood our life, to access our life, to go through our life and impact others' lives. What is it? It's humility. So what if we don't have humility? <clears throat> we close the gate valve. Pride clogs the pipeline. It closes the access. Now, we all know this. God gives grace to the humble. What does he do to the proud? He resists them. And so when you allow pride into your life, <clears throat> the grace of God shuts off. What opens up the pipeline? Humility. God gives grace to the humble. <clears throat> And the grace opens up and the power, the life, the strength of heaven flows in. So ironically, if we were to just compare it like intellectual notes on this, it's like, is it more wise to be humble or is it more wise to be proud? Well, you'd be the biggest doofus on earth to choose pride as your means of operating in the kingdom of heaven. And yet many of us do exactly that and we have our reasons for it. It's like, well, they, they offended me. Well, did you hear what they said? I mean, how can I just stand here and take that? Well, I understand that from a human vantage point. However, you've been bought with a price and you've been given the Holy Spirit. You've been given everything you need for life and godliness. And I have a hunch that that includes this exact situation, which means you've been given something to be able to make a choice in the right direction in every situation. That doesn't mean we will, but when we don't, what can we do? We can still humble ourselves. You ever made a wrong decision and chosen pride and then realize that God's grace is still available for you to now humble yourself? And so one of the things I've always described about my dad is I said he was the perfect dad. And of course, that sounds, you know, all the dads then feel uncomfortable and they're like, great, there's a perfect dad out there. I've been feeling all terrible about my dadhood and now there's this perfect dad figures that Eric would have him, right? When in actuality, what I mean by that isn't that he behaved perfectly. It's that when, he, when God showed him his imperfections, what did he do? He perfectly responded to them. You see, there is a correct response to your imperfections, and that's to humble yourself. And my dad did that over and over and over again. He would humble himself when he recognized that his parenting was off, when he recognized that his tone of voice was wrong, when he recognized he should have been there instead of over here, and he wasn't present when he was supposed to be. And so what did he do? He corrected it. He took the low seat. That changed my life. I was impacted by my dad choosing to take the low seat, ironically, after he didn't take the low seat. In other words, God's grace takes our, even our blunt, blunt I was going to say bungles, blunders, and I combined it, our blunders and transforms them into greater advance. Isn't that an amazing thought? In other words, even if we have been functioning in pride, God gets even more advantage out of us now humbling ourselves because of our pride. And so that's where Paul says, so I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, should we go on sinning that grace may abound? 
Because every time I sin, I even get more advanced in my spiritual life. He goes, no, 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 no. That isn't how it works. Even though it's true that God does get even more advantage when, we, when he overcomes our sin with his grace, that doesn't mean we purposely go out and behave as idiots. I'm going to choose the high seat and get all sorts of exaltation, all sorts of honor, all sorts of riches, and then I'm going to humble myself right before I die. And that's a very dangerous way to live. Some of us have actually had that thought go through our head. That was actually, if you're going to catch me in my collegiate days, I had that thought go through my head. I feel terrible even acknowledging it, but it's like, wait a minute. So all these people get to live however they want because they don't know Jesus. And they get to, you know, live free and sin and all that. But I, because I know Christ, have to give all that up. There's a whole life to be lived here. Come on, God. What if? So that's, that's where it comes in. What if I blow my life on sin and self, and then right at the end, I'm like, oh, God, by the way, I am so sorry about all that. And I choose to take the low seat right before I enter. And, oh, hey, that's a brilliant way to do it. And Paul says, you're wasting your life. You've been given one shot at this thing. Use it for the glory of God. Actually, better to choose the low seat now. Like in every way, the advantage is real. There is no advantage to spending your life in Satan's kingdom. None. There's a bait that says, oh, I'll take good care of you. I'll give you true life. You know, you talk to basically any Hollywood actor or any very successful musician and you recognize they're the most depressed people. They're usually on some kind of medication, pills, or drugs to try and elevate their perspective because it's death to the soul to sell yourself to Satan to get the pleasures of this earth instead of giving them up so that you can get the pleasures of heaven now and always. We as Christians, we have it good. James 4, 6, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Learning to go low. The exercise of sharing funny and embarrassing moments. So in my life, this has been a very unique thing for me to work through. Because I have had multiple layers of God working this in, sort of tilling in this idea of humility. And the moment I think I've got it down, he has to do it again. And I'm even sensing, even, you know, I'm giving this message, that I want to freshly come before the living God and say, God, even though I've been low and I've been in that seat before, I don't want to just try and make my way up the table. I want to freshly go back to that seat. Every room I walk into, I want that seat. I do not want to think that, oh, I spent my time in that seat. Now it's my time to be in, you know, a higher seat. Come on. Isn't that the way it works? That's how, you know, the retirement mentality works. It's like, I spent my time working, and now I don't need to. That isn't how the soul and the human life is built. We are built to expend, to work on behalf of the glory of God in agreement with the glory of God. I can't imagine that, you know, God says, yeah, spiritual retirement. You know, the last 20 years of your life are just going to be you flopping in front of the TV eating your chips. It's like, that's what I designed you for. That is the opposite of what he designed us for. He designed us to go out with a bang, to give ourselves fully and completely to him. And so learning to exercise this over and over and over again. So one of the things that I mean, there's various things I've done in my life which sort of exercise things, like to turn outward. I remember I started smiling at people when I would walk by uh, them. You know how many people don't do that? And so I'd be like, hi, hi. And I had people that'd be like, mm -hmm. or just ignore me. I'd go, hi, and they would act like they didn't hear it. It's like, you were one foot away from me. I know you heard me. Okay, now they have earbuds in a lot of times, which is another excuse to act like you don't hear Eric when I go, how you doing today? All righty. Great, great. No response, right? And that happens a lot. They're right there, you know, and I'm talking to them like, hey, hi. Uh, all right. However, it's an exercise. When I was driving down the road, I started practicing waving and smiling. Hi. And in Colorado, you don't do that. Like in the South, you do that. But in Colorado, they're like, oh, I, I didn't see that. I'm not going to respond. And so, I, but every time I was rejected, I decided to take that as strength points for my soul. See, I'm always playing a game, right? So I get points for that. Every time someone ignores me, Eric gets a point. You know, it's that, that type of mentality. And so you can rack up a lot of points. But the same is true with this. There's a lot of opportunity you have to acknowledge weakness. And so, for instance, I'm, I'm leaving a hotel, and there's like these big glass doors and big glass walls next to it. And I walk right into a glass wall. It wasn't a door. 
most people are going to act like it didn't happen. And they're going to be like, <laughs> and then they're going to find their way to the real door and make their way out and then run for their life. Eric has to practice something different. And that is someone's walking out. Did you guys just see that? I just tried to walk out of this window. I like have to announce it. And it's a deliberate thing in my soul that's actually been very important for me is to acknowledge my weakness and to not try and cover it, to not try and make myself seem like I have no issues, but to quickly acknowledge them. And ironically, it makes life very pleasant when you can laugh at yourself. When you can poke at yourself, it makes it a lot easier to go to the lowest seat as opposed to when you can't. If you take those you know, walking into window moments in life too seriously and someone does see it, it mortifies you. And then the rest of the day, you're thinking about what everyone thinks about you. It's just a lot better to announce it. Hey, people, I just walked into a window. All right? An absolute buffoon. Yes, I agree. That's me. And ironically, it helps quicken the pace of me getting into that low seat instead of trying to climb my way up the table. The bartender moment, one of the classic moments in my life. This was really hard for me to acknowledge, okay? It was very embarrassing in the moment because it happened in, all of my in front of all of my friends in college. And John F. Kennedy Jr. Was, uh, was in the discussion back then when I was in college, and I guess he had taken the bar exam and failed it like multiple times, and he was uh, now taking it for like the third or fourth time. I don't remember the exact story. But I remember they were we were talking about that at uh, dinner, and then we were walking back to the dorms as a bunch of guys. You know, you want to you wanna put your best foot forward around your buddies. You want them to think highly about you, to, to think that you're really smart. I mean, I'm a biology chemistry double major. It's like, hey, drop that into the conversation every now and then. You know, it's like, hey, I'm, I'm really smart. Well, this is one of those moments that I wasn't very smart. So I'll just put it that way. I don't know how you get blind spots in your education growing up, but I had one. I had never heard of this idea of a bar exam being for a law degree, okay? It had never been tied in. I had heard of a, a bar exam, but I thought that was to become a bartender. So I decided in that moment on the way back from uh, dinner to make my big announcement. I was really upset. It's like, I don't know why no one brings this up, but why would the son of a president be studying to be a bartender? That's what I said. And everyone was looking at me like, he's joking, right? He's joking. Oh, I wasn't joking. Eesh. So it was really hard for me for a long time. Like, I didn't want anyone to know that. I was afraid that my buddies were going to start passing it around, that I actually thought that. It was mortifying to me that I had that blind spot. Now, those types of things now come out very quickly, but that's part of the exercise. It's deliberately choosing to go low and to share a story like that, which then other people can laugh at. And truly, when someone laughs at you and they recognize that you're not insecure, it is actually a gift to them too. It brings life to people around you because all of us have those weaknesses that very few people are willing to ever share them. So when someone does, it is delightful to the human side of us. It really is. It's like a gift that you give. The message. So some of you that have gone through Ellerslie know because I always give the message every semester. And there was a time in uh, when I was traveling to Australia and I sense that I needed to give this one message. They had this revival down there that was, was this very weird revival. It involved like barking, roaring, slithering, and laughter, okay? And it was like, this is a weird revival. And I had spent a lot of time studying revival, praying for revival, so I was disturbed. And so I gave a message on true revival. It's one of the biggest risks I've ever taken in my life. But what it involved is four stories that put me in a low seat, every one of them. It basically caused me to look foolish Four, four times over. And it's amazing how God used this message. This message, I ended up giving it four different times when I was in Australia. And every time, I would say a micro revival broke out. Confession of sin. It was incredible. I, I mean, literally, I witnessed the power of God in and through me humbling myself and sharing stories that made me look ridiculous, but showed how God took that moment and restored me through it. And Here's, here, if I could say the impact that that's had on my life is I've recognized that the power of true ministry and the power of the Holy Spirit comes out of that position, not out of me looking smart 
and intellectual in front of an audience and using big words and sounding like I'm a grand theologian. My style of communication gets mocked by a lot of Christian leaders because I don't sound smart. I choose to do that. Even if I was smart, I don't know that I'd want you to know that I was smart. I want you to hear truth. That is my passion. And if I need to be the butt of every joke to make that happen, so be it. However, I still have to exercise that. And there are still the moments, they still happen. I don't know why, you think it would just go, but it doesn't. There, the flicker is there, and I want to self-preserve, especially when someone really comes against me in a caustic way and diminishes my intelligence publicly. I, I don't know if you guys ever heard the story, but one of my rules in life is never read my press clippings. Okay, it's just a bad idea. I've told my kids this from a young age. I never read, you know, your Amazon reviews. Never read any of this stuff. It has no benefit to you whatsoever. When you're in my position, you have a lot of different reviews and a lot of different opinions. It, I just stopped reading them a long time ago. And it all started with one thing where I was on Amazon and I decided to look up. So, oh, hey, I got, you know, got some five stars here. And so I was looking through it and there was a one star. A one star? Who would dare give a one star? So I look at it and I tell you what. <laughs> They were so harsh on me. You know, this guy has only one thing on his mind. Every, every book he writes is all about the same exact thing, Jesus. That you sur surrender to Jesus. He, he just repackages the same exact message. I'm thinking, well, this is what I do. Uh, but, but it was so harsh. And he was saying, if you want to hear an intelligent Christian speak, read these books. Don't read a Ludi book. Ooh, those are fighting words. Those are fighting words because I have a mind. I could speak big words. So I was in the process of writing a foreword to one of my books. I don't remember which one it was. And so I turned it in. And before I left leave and had a chance to see it, it's like, I'm just getting this thing in. I'm going to prove to some people that I have a brain. I had all sorts of huge words in it. It was so smart and intelligent. I mean, people are going to be so impressed with Eric Ludy. And I sent it in to the editor. And the editor gets back and he goes, uh, <clears throat> Very interesting uh, forward. Doesn't really match the flavoring of the book. Uh, I needed a dictionary to even read it. And I'm thinking, well, that's right. You see? You see? That's some smarts right there. But in the, at the same time, what's God doing? He's like, <clears throat> especially when Leslie reads it, he's like, what is this? Like, uh, all right, I shouldn't have sent that in. <laughs> yeah, we're not using that. Yeah, the, what was I doing? I was trying to take a higher seat on my own. Instead of letting God do it. Mary of Bethany was criticized very harshly by Martha. Then she was criticized very harshly by Judas. In both situations, she remained in the low seat and Jesus spoke for her. When you are in that low seat, even if someone else is sticking you in the low seat, say thank you. This is the seat I wanted. And you can keep your mouth shut. That's the exercise of humbling yourself. The steps downward. So here's some samples of how it works, okay? And it doesn't always go in this order, but this is a pretty good order. And you're going to recognize that you have probably progressed in different things in this. And there's times you'll go down the list and then go back up the list, right? And then need to go back down the list. But I don't know that any of us in here have made it all the way down the list, okay? This is a two-pager, by the way. So this is just one part of it. Willingness to acknowledge wrong. That's a big step, but that's where it starts. I was wrong. You see, have you ever heard the statement, because I've, I've said it before, that you can measure humility, that the moment you know you're wrong, the clock starts ticking, and the moment you acknowledge that wrong is your measurement of humility. So if you know you're wrong, what should you do in that next tick of the clock? That's right. That was wrong. That was wrong. My, my tone is wrong. My attitude is wrong. That really messes up a good argument. To you're in a good argument, and then suddenly you humble yourself right in the middle of it. It really messes with the other person. Like, ah, I was ready to attack you, and now what do I do? Willingness to confess sin publicly. Yeesh. Willingness to laugh at my own embarrassments. Willingness to be rebuked by elders. It's one thing to be rebuked by an elder. Look at this next one. Willingness to be rebuked by donkeys. Okay, now a donkey, you can sort of fit in who might be in that category. But someone who isn't over you and maybe shouldn't be saying it to you, but still does. And to absorb that and to choose a low seat, even if they're wrong, even if what they're saying is not even truthful, that you still stay in a low seat. That is hard. 
willingness to appear a failure. I don't want to look that way. I don't want people to think those thoughts. Willingness to have your good evil spoken of. What you were doing was for the glory of God. You were doing it because you loved someone, but someone else is reinterpreting it. And they're casting it in a blog. For, they're saying, here's his real motive. It was my motive. I was doing this because I love Jesus. And so, oh boy, do I have illustrations of all of these. I could almost feel like I could write a book on this topic. Willingness to have the credit given elsewhere. You did all the work and the credit is going to someone else? Excuse me? Low seat. Willingness to be mocked. Willingness to be falsely accused. Willingness to be treated as less than human. Willingness to give up everything, even life. Now, you're going to start recognizing as we get into this lower territory here that there's someone who has gone before us in every single one of these things. And if there was anyone who should not have gone through that, it would be Jesus. And yet he led the way. Willingness to be stripped of covering. Willingness to be thought of as a criminal. Willingness to suffer as a criminal. Willingness to die as a criminal. It's not just willingness to die. It's to die with your reputation blandished. With your reputation mud spattered upon it. How, God, I, I can't allow the world to think these thoughts of me. Eric, technically all that matters is my thoughts about you. Are you willing to take the low seat? And then right when we thought we've taken the lowest seat, we realize there's a lower seat. <laughs> it's like, I didn't know that one was there. <laughs> Eric, you're moving into a new season of your life. I'd like to introduce you to even a lower seat. Jesus took the low seat. He was a worm, treated as a worm and not even as a man. The dog was the lowest uh, character in the Jewish culture. He was treated lower than a dog. That's an amazing thought to think that the creator of the heavens and the earth came to this earth to rescue us and was willing to model something that many of us really struggle with. We don't mind the fact that he did it. We don't want to have to follow this. Philippians 2, 5 through 11, many of us, for many of us, it's our favorite scripture, but this is the very pattern that it exhibits. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, as a result of this humility, as a result of this obedience, Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And finally, uh, final scripture for us to just leave with, Isaiah fifty-seven fifteen, For thus says the high and lofty one who, dwell, who, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Father, we recognize that we naturally have a repulsion to the low seat. But we also recognize that you desire us to take that seat, and that in doing so, your purposes in our life unfold. So Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would inspect us now, would search us, and would show us if there is anything in us that is hindering us from taking that seat, any pride that is closing off our gate valve and hindering the flow of grace into our life and through our life. I pray that we'd be sensitive to what you are saying right now and say yes and agree with you to go low.
to choose the lowly chair. It's in the precious name we ask this.